Welcome back, guys, to the Great Ace Attorney 2 Resolve. Well, last episode, continuing with the testimony about the evening of February 17th, we received the note that Olive Green had in her possession as evidence, matching with the torn off part found in Shamspear's room to prove she was at the scene of the crime. We then heard about the anomaly of the note where Miss Green proclaimed she had no reason to be there, so he presented the poison in the bottle as a reason why, pointing out to be strychnine as we started down the slide to our conclusion. With revenge on the mind for the young artist due to Duncan Ross's death at the hands of William Shamspear, however, neither of our accused feel willing to admit to their crimes as we head towards the truth. Tell the court what you found, what evidence your search revealed. Well, I spotted the note that I sent him lying on the floor. When I went to pick it up, I noticed something. One of the floorboards was loose, and underneath it, I discovered a secret hiding place. Eh? Yes, we also discovered the hiding place. Inside, we found a newspaper cutting, a photograph, and an empty tin box. Ah, yes. Well, the thing is, when I found it, the box wasn't empty. What? There was something in it. Yes. This rather nice key. Ah! What are you doing with that? What the? Every ounce of color is drained from his face. Give it here. Give it to me now. It's mine. I inherited it. What was that witness? What did you say? You inherited it. Ah, uh, um, no, I, uh... What's all this about? He inherited that key. It was obviously important to you since you'd gone to such lengths to hide it. So I took it. I don't know what it's for, but you took something precious from me, so I took something precious from you. So what if it means you can't open something now? I don't care. Give it back this minute. Give it to me. Calm yourself, witness. So Mr. Shanspear has tried and in one case succeeded to take the life of two lodgers now. Yes, his motive for doing so is the key to everything that's happened. It's true that there appears to be no motive to support the accusation against Mr. Shamspear, at first. But considering everything we now know, I think there is actually something that could explain it. What? I need to recall every piece of evidence at our disposal. Everything we've seen and heard. Because I'm sure that I just caught a glimpse of the link that runs through all of these events. In that case, the counsel. I must demand that you present evidence to the court in support of your claim. What is it that you say can explain the motivation for Mr. Shanspear's alleged crimes? Right, so here we go. We're going down that slippery slide, and now it's time to look at evidence that we have not used or looked at before. So with that said, it's time to bring another part of everything into this. The fact that someone lived there that was... A murderer who died whilst in prison, his final moments witnessed only by his cellmate, who had £1,000 worth of loot he stole that remains uncovered. A mysterious key going on as well. Alerted by the shouts of his fellow cellmate, medical staff arrived to find him already dead before his capital punishment could be carried out. Natural causes, you say. Okay. So, your inheritance. Is that what's going on? You were the cellmate? Take that! And that's an official police report, is it not? The Selden file? How did you get hold of that? S Selden? The now sadly deceased Mr. Ross and the defendant Mr. Natsume have only one thing linking them. The fact that they had lodgings in the same room. Well, yes, we know this, certainly. A room that was formerly occupied by Selden. Until, that is, he was arrested by Scotland Yard for his involvement in multiple burglaries. Hmm, I see. And it so happens that the convict Selden left behind... Oh, the convict Selden left behind one very substantial mystery when he died. Some £1,000 worth of loot that he stole, which as yet remains to be found. Ah, yes, of course. It's coming back to me now. It's written in this file here. A thousand pounds lost en route to hell. That was how the papers summed it up. 
and it seems that one particular fellow inmate was with the convict in his final moments. It's not hard to imagine Selden entrusting that inmate with his most closely guarded secret, a location of the stolen loot, and perhaps a key to unlock whatever container the valuables were in. Ah, uh, you mean this key is... Mr. Shamspit, it was you, wasn't it? You were at the Capital Offender's side when he died, were you not? What are you talking about? It is a false charge, I tell you, a false charge! The name of the inmate who was with Selden at his death is noted in this file. But a simple telegram to the prison where he died would quickly tell us how false the charge really is. Uh, uh... But, but even if it's true, why would the man be so intent on killing every subsequent occupant of the Kelmvik's lodgings? There's only one explanation for that, my lord. It was in that very room that Selden hid his loot. So, it all comes out. Yes, and having established that, all of Mr. Shamsby's subsequent actions start to make perfect sense. When he was let out of prison following Selden's death, he made immediately for Mr. Garadib's lodgings in the hope of renting Selden's old room. However, the retired army man was unable to offer him the accommodation of his choice. Because Selden's old room had already been let to somebody else, Mr. Duncan Ross. Ah! Which is why Mr. Shamsby subsequently devised his gas-based plot to kill the occupant of the room. And when he was successful, he presumably intended to inquire about switching into the newly vacant room. However, a certain jittery someone had beaten him to it. Mr. Sozeki Natsume, a defendant of this case, no less. So you decided to use the ploy with the gas again, didn't you, Mr. Shamspear? This time to oust Mr. Natsume. All for one simple and avaricious reason. To get your hands on the thousand pounds of loot left behind by the dead convict. Ah, uh, you... Ah! Uh, ah! Uh! Are we there? Looks like I'm gonna snuff it before they get to stretch me neck. Listen, I want you to have me loot. Anything to stop the coppers getting their mitts on it. It's sitting in the room where I was lodging when they got me. Here, this is the key to it. Take it. Always stay one step ahead. Mate. See you in hell, I guess. Shamspear. Smine. What did he just say? It's mine. That loot is mine. M Mr. Shamspear! It's all lies. I don't accept any of it. Why should I? After all, you don't have a shred of evidence. You can't prove I killed that fellow. Forsooth, I'm the victim here, remember? Isn't that right, ladies and gentlemen? If I don't admit to it, there's nothing you can do. You can't arrest me? For the time being, anyway. Barely, you can't arrest the victim, can you? Isn't that right, ladies and gentlemen? I'm so close. I just need a few more hours. I swore to myself that I'd get my hands on it. And I can almost taste it now. Do you really think I'd just give up? There's no question in my mind now. This man is guilty through and through. But he seems so utterly intoxicated by the idea of that loot. I'm afraid that however hard you press him, he'll never admit to what he's done, Mr. Nadahodo. There is a way. Pardon? There's one way I can finish him. No! He's already committed the most heinous crimes to get his hand on the loot. Which means all we need to do is find it first. 
a fine plan. Were it not for the fact that the police thoroughly searched the, po the room following the death of Mr. Ross. If it's there at all, it must be very well hidden indeed. Hmm. Without conclusive evidence, I certainly cannot rule. If only... If only there was some way we could find the convict's loot quickly. This is the final piece in this complex puzzle. But I think we might have it in our possession already. Or rather, I think we may well have something that can help us find where that loot is hidden. My lord. Yes, Council. The defense would like to make a proposal about how to find the late convict's hidden loot. I believe we are already in possession of something that could give us a clue as to its whereabouts. It's our last chance, so it has to be worth a gamble. Besides, we've used the same technique once already and it definitely paid off then. Very well then, Council. Let the court hear your idea. What do you propose we can use in order to locate the hiding place of the deceased convict's hall? <laughs> Sudden pause of just looking going, eh? Well, if we want to follow a trail, what we've used to find things already, and it worked, and possibly the court will accept at least trying it. It's too bad we don't have it specifically. But... Can we use this? I mean, one, I always thought that there was some kind of like, uh, safe behind that. Is there still a safe behind that and the key was just pilfered? Is that what happened and he just got there and didn't have the key? But he needed to get in that space room, so you'd expect not. But I'm guessing if we had some kind of skin sample of the deceased, we could get there, but no. That's the thing that we have for following a trail. That's the only thing we have for following a trail, isn't it? That's the only thing we can use to locate a thing. If it's in Natsume's room, obviously we could just go in Natsume's room and search every corner of it. So we are trying to present a way that could be used. So it's got to be this. Take that! If I'm not mistaken, those are Mr. Shamsby's handprint on the walls of his lodging. That's right, my lord. Exposed as a result of the defense's independent investigation of the scene. Based on a wonderful new discovery in the field of forensic science by the great detective, Mr. Sholmes. A great detective! Is that some kind of joke? Do you really think I'm going to be daunted by a man with such a ridiculous title? I should think the Great Bard ought to recognize such a title when he hears one, Mr. Shamspear. Perhaps we should compete for the honor of most ridiculous title. Ah, it is Herlock Sholmes himself. What are you doing here, great detective? No usual haunts of the filthy back streets of the capital, are they not? Ah, Mr. Leeper, it's been too long. And I see your complexion has worsened since last we met. But Mr. Sholmes. He does know Lord Van Zeeks, then. Well, enough to say something like that in any case. And Mr. Sholmes, though you may be heralded as a great detective by the population at large, that does not give you the right to come and go in my courtroom as you see fit. If I may, my lord, Mr. Sholmes' newly developed scientific method has helped us to uncover vital clues in this case already. Clues, you say? I call them skin prints, my lord. My method identifies every location touched by an individual under scrutiny. It's the method by which we were able to ascertain this gentleman's gas pipe activities. Ah! We need only a small sample of something the individual has previously touched to make it indicate a solution. In your case, sir, I used the teacup you had been holding. Elementary. So now, Mr. Nadohodo. Ah, uh, yes? What am I to use as a sample to make the indicator solution this time? Thank you for your offering to help, Mr. Sholmes. When the convict was arrested, he was living in what is now sosaki -san's room. We need a sample to help locate Solon's loot that's hidden in his old room. What form will the sample take? Present evidence or present a person? I'm like, really confused.
I was thinking of saying, like, the key is something he's touched, but of course, nothing's very recent. Does someone have something of his? Well, I mean, well, I guess Olive has the key. So I could go with that line of thought. It's the only object that we know he's definitely touched in this room, right? We will need something of Seldon's in order to create the indicator solution to find his loot. And something the convict owned happens to be in the possession of somebody listed in the court record. Upon my word, Mr. Nadahodo, your powers of reasoning appear to be on the up. So, which particular person do you have in mind? From whom can we obtain a possession of the late convict Seldon to create the indicator solution? We got it. Take that! Miss Green. Uh, me? What do you want with me? The key around your neck, if you please. Sorry. That key belonged to Selden. There will be remnants of secretions from the man's skin on its surface that we can use. Very true. We hope. That is the sample we need. Using it, we can create the indicated solution required for Mr. Sholmes' skin print seeker. And find out exactly what Selden touched in the room that he used to rent. Ah! Mr. Shamspear, as one great to another, I assure you. If the late convict's hall is hidden somewhere in his former lodgings, I shall uncover it in no more than 30 minutes. Ah! So, Mr. Shamspear, the truth is well within our grasp now, and as such, you will never get your hands on Selden's stolen wealth. Ah! 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 In that case, I'll gladly let Mr. Sholmes have this key. No! Give the key to me! The detective shan't have it! It's over, Mr. Shamspear. No! No! You're out of options now. There's only one thing left for you to do. Admit your guilt. Whoa! Oh, Shamspear! Despair! Be thy name! We got a confetti gun now that we were shooting with? I never intended to kill the man. I just... I just wanted to drive him out of the room. That's all. So you'd have time to find the convict's hall of stolen goods. Yet after you'd killed the young man, you still didn't move into the room. I asked the landlord, of course. I pleaded with him. But he refused. Why? I was three months behind with the rent. For one thing. Mr. Garadip really has had a lot to put up with. And he had the gas repair work done immediately afterwards, putting the room out of action for a while. And then, this Japanese man swooped in at just the right moment to sign the new lease. Oh, Mr. Natsume, what unfortunate timing. And then, five days ago, after the incident on Bria Road, when the Japanese fellow got himself arrested, I thought I'd finally have my chance, but it wasn't to be. No, the scene was sealed off and guarded by the police night and day. And if I remember rightly, Mr. Shelm spent the whole day in there reading books. I couldn't even enter the room, let alone search for the loot. Which is why on the day Mr. Natsume was acquitted and returned to his room, you once again tried your trick of blowing air into the gas pipe that feeds the stove in his room. Unbeknownst to you, however, that action would lead you into a deadly trap. William Shamspear, how does it go? To be or not to be, that is the question. From Shakespeare's Hamlet, Act 3, Scene 1. Well, let me tell you, in your case, it's not to be. That is the answer. You deserve to die for what you've done.
At first, I really did think it was just a terrible accident. I'll never forget our conversation the night before Duncan died. The gas supply in my new lodgings are a complete disaster, you know, Olive. The gas supply? Yes, the stove always seems to go out in the middle of the night for some reason. That's no joke. They say it's the convict's curse. Oh, Duncan, please don't stay there. I don't care how cheap it is. All right, then. If it's that important to you, I'll start looking for a new place. There are spare rooms in my house. Why don't you leave that horrible room tonight? No, I'd better not. We said we'd wait until we'd graduate before we told our parents, remember? But that was the last time we ever spoke. That very night, he fell victim to the gas. If only I'd known it was going to happen. I'd have insisted he left that horrible room that instant. But instead, all I've been left with is bitter regret. I stopped going to school. But something kept drawing me back to the house on Briar Road. I saw a stooped, eaten looking man with a moustache coming out of the house one day when I was there. He walked up the road to Grub's Grubbery for some food, so I followed him up. And sat myself down next to him. He had some watery looking soup and started to pick a quarrel with the publican. A place is cursed, I tell you, cursed! The ghost of that convict who used to live there is trying to suffocate me! I, I wake up in the middle of the night for, for freezing to death because the stove has gone out. The room is f f full of gas and I can h hardly breathe. But the pipes have been checked. No problem there. It's like, I'm the problem. That's what they're thinking. But how could that be? Duncan was gone and now this man had almost suffered the same fate. Could it really be a curse? Then I remembered. A rumor I'd heard about how the gas companies go around investigating the gas installations. A rumor? Ah, you mean... Yes, everybody's heard the stories, it seems, about how they go around checking the pipes. How anything connected to the gas can be extinguished by blowing air into the pipework. That's when it started. A little flicker of doubt in the back of my mind that just wouldn't go away. Was it really an accident, though? Once I'd had the idea, it wouldn't leave me alone. It plagued me day and night. So I bought this at one of the black markets in the East End. A uh, black market? I'd never been. I just heard people talk about them. And you really can buy anything you can think of there. In some ways, being able to get my hands on this so easily made me even more determined. I had to find out one way or another. Was Duncan's death an accident? Or was it murder? And your chosen method for establishing the truth was simple, but highly effective. Smear poison on the gas pipe you suspected the man of tampering with, and wait. If Mr. Shamspear was innocent, nothing would come of what you'd done. But if he was guilty, he would pay for his crimes dearly. Wow. Even you made a... You did it in a way that wouldn't kill an innocent person, except maybe the gas company guy. A very unlucky gas company guy. I found out the name of the man I suspected, William Shamspear. And then I wrote him this little note. I have information regarding the death of Duncan Ross. Come to the Slug and Salad on Bria Road at 5pm on 17th. Don't tell anybody else about this letter or the meeting. It is a matter of utmost importance. If he'd done it, I knew that would worry him enough so we'd be sure to go. So I waited to see if it worked. And of course, Mr. Shamsbeer followed the instructions to the letter. I worked out where the gas pipe was straight away. So I smeared a good amount of the poison I'd bought all around the mouth of the pipe. All the time praying that the devil's work wouldn't be done and that it was all just some wild fantasy. Actually, no. All the time praying that the devil's work would be done and that the culprit would get his just desserts. Fair dues, I guess. I mean, I can understand the sentiment, can't you? <laughs> if this was the guy that killed her fiance, fiance.
and let death come to him too. Three days ago, when you were first stood in the dock before me, this whole affair seemed relatively straightforward. Yes, my lord. I certainly never imagined the depths of depravity that we would subsequently find lurking behind the scenes. It has been a long road, my Nipponese friend. Oh, yes! And one I certainly didn't envisage walking with you. Nevertheless, together we have reached the light at the end of the tunnel, as it were. Miss Green. Yes, my lord. And you will henceforth be stripped of your freedom. As punishment for the attempted murder of Mr. William Shamspear. Yes, I know. And you, Mr. Shamspear, you will be tried for the murder of Mr. Duncan Ross in cold blood. And the subsequent attempted murder of Mr. Sosaki Natsumi here present. Uh. Um, Mr. Nalahodo? Ah, uh, yes? Yesterday at the hospital. When you and your friends stopped me from... From ending your life by drinking what was left in the poison bottle. I... I wasn't myself. I can't even really remember what was going through my mind. To be or not to be, I suppose. That's a question that's so hard to answer, it seems. Well, personally, I'm glad of your being here, Miss Green. Oh. And I'd like to believe that it's a blessing Mr. Shamspear didn't die when he ingested the poison. For your sake, at the very least. Because of you, I chose life, not death. And now, you've made the truth come out at last. Really, I can't thank you enough. Oh, Miss Green! Mr. Sotoki Natsume! Yes, my lord. The court declares that you are exonerated from all blame in this matter. Accordingly, I would call upon the ladies and gentlemen of the jury to present a verdict of not guilty. We are in full agreement, my lord. In that case, I hereby declare the defendant. I always feel like he should get something for going through all this trouble. You know what I mean? He's had to go through a lot this week. <laughs> I guess he gets to go home, right? Court is adjourned! So it's time to celebrate! 23rd of February, the Old Bailey Defendant's Annet Chamber. We did it again. Oh, yes, yes, at last! Divine justice duly done! Divine justice? My dear fellow, if there were any divine justice in this world, you would have shaved that mustache! No, this has nothing to do with my mustache! Some say that a luxuriant mustache is a sign of physical prowess, Mr. Shones. Locum student Mr. Nalohodo Esquire! Once again, once again, you've saved me from doom! I'm very happy to have been able to help, Mr. Natsume. Congratulations on your acquittal. You're second in almost as many days. I was first acquainted with and gained affection for English literature whilst in our great homeland empire. And then, by a twist of fate, I was brought to the land that bore the fruit of that literature. Only... The city of bricks and mortar became my prison. Try as I might, I never found my feet here. In the end, I confined myself to my room and lived life through friendly old books. You've had such a difficult time, haven't you? Ah, but a week ago now. I dragged you out of that dark and did you room of yours, did I not? You did, you did. And I've seen more of life in this week than in all my years to date. And for the first time, 
I feel I've begun to see the true face of the English that's so far been hidden or hiding from me behind the wool of fog. My dear fellow, there's nothing special about the true face of the English, as you put it. Wheresoever one goes in the world, humans are human. There are few genuine differences. Indeed. Yes, I think you're right. I finally started to see that, and I've come to understand something. I've worked out why I was attracted to English literature in the first place. It made me see that whatever our nationality, we humans all have the same hopes and fears. We're all just doing our best to live. Well said. I kind of feel the same way. I've made a decision too. I'm going to cut short my study tour here and return to Japan. What? Just when we'd become friends here in England. What a terrible shame. I know, that does tug at my heartstrings, it really does. But I've decided I'd like to take everything I've learned here in Britain and write something on my own. A novel of sorts, I suppose. Oh my, so you'll be creating your own literature, Miss Anatomy. How wonderful. Oh, well, no, I mean, I wouldn't have presumed to call it literature. Presume. Why not, when that is precisely the definition, Mr. Mustache? I suppose you're right, yes. It will, in a way, be literature. But as of now, all I know is that I'd like to try my hand at writing. I have no delusions of grandeur. I, for one, would love to read your work. Well, all things considered, it may be for the best. After all, you have once again emerged victorious from a battle with the Reaper. Ah, uh, that's very true. And there is no salvation for a person in a dock when the Reaper is the prosecutor. The desire to return post haste to the perceived safety of your homeland is one I quite understand. My goodness, yes! Faced with such a terrifying prospect. Nobody would consider that cowardly, I'm quite sure. But, but that's, that's not why I'm leaving. I mean it. And that was the case that we found ourselves in broad in six months ago now. So Sekisan did indeed return to Japan and submitted a report about both cases to the government. It was on reading that report that Professor Mikotoba was prompted to visit the scholar. And barely any time later, Suzato-san was given the news that she must return to Japan as well. On the back of a telegram stating falsely that her father had fallen gravely ill. The only possible explanation that comes to mind is what happened after the trial on the following day. The day that we uncovered the loot hidden by the now deceased convict in his former lodgings. What happened? Oh, well done, Mr. Sholmes. How simply marvelous of you to uncover the secret hiding place in just one day. Wasn't it supposed to take 30 minutes? As I believe I told you, my dear fellows, skin prints are extremely useful in such situations. Wouldn't you agree, Gregson? Gregson's been happily munching in agreement this whole time, you know, Hurley. Happily, I think perhaps humorlessly might be closer to the truth. So, it transpires the man fashioned a hiding place in the ceiling. And what's in it? What exactly is the loot? Let us look then, if you're ready. Let's examine the late burglar's hall. What the? What is that? It... Looks to be some sort of neckband or collar. A collar? It's huge though! And look at all the gemstones set in it! I can see why it was claimed to be worth a thousand pounds. Perhaps I can have it as a belt. Oh, have you noticed on the inside there? There are some dark stains. You... You don't think... They could be blood, do you? I mean, there's... Quite a lot of it. On second thoughts, perhaps I won't have it as a belt. 
Then, of course, there's this emblem here. A large letter B and a small crown. What does it signify, do you think? Oh, I, I hadn't noticed that. Huh. I feel as though I've seen that emblem somewhere before, you know? Where could it have been? That's enough of that, I think. What? What's the matter with Mr. Sholmes? All the colour is drained from his face. Well, Inspector, I believe you ought to be taking this, so oughtn't you? It could be valuable evidence after all. It must be kept safely under lock and key. Ah, yes. Get your grubby hands off that, you lot, and hand it over now. I'd never seen a collar that large before. And all those jewels certainly look to be extremely valuable. That's not what stood out the most to me. At least, not once I'd noticed it. Those dark marks on the inside of the collar. Those stains. Could they really have been... Blood? Well, that was a funny case, wasn't it? But it's all burned up now. And you look very pleased, Iris. I am, because I was starting to wonder what I could use as the basis of this month's story in the magazine. But this case will be perfect. It's been so fascinating. You're talking about the latest installment of The Adventures of Herlock Sholmes, I presume. The mystery of the knife in the mist, and the mustached man and the convict's curse, perhaps. I could make it a two-part story. Oh, I can't wait. Um, a word, please, Iris. Yes, what is it, Hurley? I'm sorry, but you can't write about this case. It's out of the question. What? Why not? It's a great case. Then I shall have to insist that you limit yourself to the first of your two titles. The second must never be written. Is that clear? Yes. And so it was that the second of Sol Seki-san's cases became buried in obscurity. Now, looking back, I feel I understand. I can see why Mr. Sholmes forbade Iris from publishing the story. It would take a little longer before I saw the link between everything that had happened and would happen. For it wasn't until two months after the arrival of Susato-san's letter that events began to unfurl again, with an incident that took place at the very heart of the eagerly awaited Great Exhibition of London. And so, our second case of resolve comes to its end. We see a little glimpse into something that now, by the look of it, will continue on in the next case, we hope. So, with that said, and with that done, and with Sosekisan, free as a bird yet again to fly away back to Japan and get into even more trouble, we wonder what our next case will bring in the big overarching story that is unfolding. Join us next time for more Great Ace Attorney, and I'll see you guys then for that. For now, Bye-bye.